Good morning. This is Arlene, and you are listening to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. In our morning news, which is called the ASEAN Daily, we bring all the interesting and up to date news on Southeast Asia or concerning this region. To start off, uh, let's talk about the A Asia QZ8501. So when it comes to Finding the black box, apparently the divers uh, has been found and it was confirmed by the Indonesian divers, sorry, Indonesian authorities. Uh, the Indonesian Transport Ministry actually said that they found the crucial black box flight recorder of the Asia plane that, cra- that crashed in the Java Sea a fortnight ago with 162 people abroad and all of them were perished. But anyway, they re- they failed to retrie- to retrieve it immediately from the seabed. That is partly because the black box was stuck under the debris from the main body of the plane. Uh, the navy divers in Jayat Jadayat State boat have succeeded in finding a very important instrument the black box but uh, the recorder is at a depth of 30 to 32 meters mm, would likely need uh, between uh, um, two days to two weeks to somehow uh, decode what is in the black box uh, what was being uh, recorded in the black box itself however um, the if if the efforts of uh, trying to si- to shift the position of the rack cage uh, in order to access the black box might not be able to uh, be successful due to the heavy debris, uh, they might use a different technique to lift up. Uh, and that different technique is using a balloon technique, which is kind of interesting because uh, it was used before to lift the tail of the Asia flight QZ is five zero one. So it seems like there's a pretty um, pretty conclusive ending to the Air Asia flight QZ eight five zero one. The main question is what, h- how did the plane, uh, how and what and what happened and how uh, did the plane r- really crash and. And what can we do next to, in order to prevent such uh, such uh, incidents to happen? Especially, Malaysia suffered three major blows in terms of our aviation flight with MH370, MH17, and of course with this the QZ8501. Next off, uh, let's talk about something that is also happening in Malaysia, which is the A, which is the ASEAN Youth Assembly. Apparently, Kairi is up uh, to set up uh, to to gain the cabinet approval. Uh, he said that in the parliament, the ASEAN Youth Assembly is aimed to increase the awareness of ASEAN and if it's done so, he hoped that the ministry can work closely the for- with the Foreign Affairs Ministry to realise a suitable mechanism in forming the Assembly. So at the initial stage, the Assembly will be mobilised by its own secretariat or through a collaboration with the Committee of ASEAN Youth Cooperation, said Kairi uh, at the Youth Parliament session in the Day 1 right yet. Uh, last week, the Committee on International Relations at the Youth Parliament sitting on Saturday proposed a motion for the government to form an ASEAN Youth Assembly as a medium of discussion at and regional policy making among youth from Southeast Asia. This is very good uh, to talk about youth parliament or youth assembly among ASEAN leaders. This is something that uh, the People's Forum, the youth forums uh, in the ASEAN region has been voiced out uh, to, for governments in Southeast Asia to create one because 
right now, the kind of power structure within ASEAN is very much top down. It's very intergovernmental uh, decision making is very much on the top, uh, while below, uh, when it comes to young people, especially people, uh, we, we, I mean, young people somehow do not have a say in what should be done or what kind of agenda should be discussed at the ASEAN summit. Hopefully, with the youth parliament or the ASEAN youth assembly. Uh, more young people can take part in uh, providing interesting ideas and thought-provoking views, uh, especially to the government, especially in forming policies that favours the youth. So um, it's still being approved by the cabinet. Hopefully it can be approved as soon as possible, especially Malaysia is the chairman of the 2015 ASEAN Summit. And also this year is the realization of the ASEAN community. A lot of things is happening and Malaysia is taking lead. So hopefully this will uh, materialize in a way that is more consistent. We will take a short break. When we return, we will discuss more about many more news uh, about Southeast Asia. ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hey, you're back again with me, Arlene, uh, bringing you more news from Southeast Asia. So we start off our news outside of Southeast Asia. Uh, as you all know, Sri Lanka has a new president. Uh, he is um, a, a new president. His name is Matri Pala Siri Sena. He pledges for new era in uh, Sri Lanka after a surprise election win. In fact, a surprise uh, defeat by the former president, uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa, who was uh, infamous for his uh, crime against humanity back in 2009, where he uh, did uh, one of the largest massacre towards the uh, Tamil in t- Sri Lanka. So anyway, the new government of Sri Lanka is moving swiftly. It's, it's quite surprising that uh, uh, Sri Lanka's uh, democracy uh, was not jeopardized. Um, in fact, we saw a lot more Tamil came out for voting and and a lot of uh, people in Sri Lanka are hoping for this new um, former... He was a former health minister but he is now the new president of Sri Lanka, Matri Pala Sirisena. And with democracy is in place, um, apparently the new government hope to dismantle the, autorita- the authoritarian rule of the previous prime, uh, president, um, like Raja Peksa, and pledge to stop blocking website and intimidation of the media and reopen an investigation into the murder of high-profile journalists. And with analysts uh, having described the election as the most significant in Sri Lanka, definitely Sri Lanka has always be po- been polarized by race and re- religion. Uh, the, Tam- the minority Tamils and the majority Sinhalese do not sit well with each other. The same with minority Muslim, very much being discriminated. So this kind of new breath of fresh air um, would somehow uh, create more changes to the political structure and the democracy in Sri Lanka. But, you know, one of the interesting part of this uh, Sri Lankan election is not so much whether uh, it, uh, there, there was a replace of government, is the process of the election itself was actually... Uh, devolved from violence. Uh, in fact, a lot of uh, analysts has predicted that perhaps there would be v- uh, widespread violence, particularly as the opposition campaign gathered momentum in the event. The pool went smoothly, interestingly, uh, with a record turned out exceeding 81%. Uh, the final count gave Sri Sena 51.2% of the votes, while Raja Paksa, who called early election confident of winning an unprecedented term, 
actually considered defeat early. Um, the seems like the smooth transition show that perhaps Sri Lanka is moving in the direction that will somehow change the kind of political dynamics that Sri Lanka has always have for the past decades. And a parliamentarian who defected uh, to Sri Sena and is likely to be an important minister in the new cabinet. Um, but we have to keep in mind that uh, Sri Sena has always been part of the Rajapaksa's uh, cabinet. He was uh, the, the former health minister. So in a way, uh, change would happen, but in a way that uh, we hope so, that's still uh, very much a huge question uh, to be answered. Uh, in the next five years, we will see what would uh, happen, what is the report card for Sri Sena. And uh, for Rajah uh, Paksa, he actually was so unpopular with the West uh, in in 2001 when he allegedly caused the death of thousands of Tamil civilians in the final phase of the civil war back then and refused to cooperate with a UN-mandated investigation leading to Sri Lanka becoming increasingly close to China. Actually, a lot of countries are close, <laughs> uh, are are very much trying to engage closely with China. But anyway, and but anyway, words are not enough to describe uh, how serious the action of the previous government of Sri Lanka was. With the new change, hopefully Sri Lanka will be uh, moving forward politically, economically, and also in terms of the. Uh, race relations in the country. Talking about uh, exemplary of good race race relation in uh, in a country, the best is of course uh, Indonesia right now. Of course, during the election or uh, between Jokowi um, and his opponent. Uh, Subianto, uh, Jokowi and his opponent. Uh, apparently, Jokowi. I mean, a lot of people predicted that Indonesia would end up in a riot. Uh, people were not happy, but uh, in in a way that it also went off sm- smoothly. Uh, so, so when it comes to Jokowi, having been through in office since October last year. Uh, it seems like he has changed a lot in terms of the political direction of, um, and also the policy direction of Indonesia. In the past, in Indonesia focused a lot on, uh, uh, focused a lot in terms of trying to, uh, ensure that ASEAN centrality is the core focus of its foreign policy, but under Joko Widodo, it seems like its foreign policy has shifted towards opening up, uh, looking at the global world itself. In fact, he seemed to be uh, making uh, the profile of Jokowi seems to make to, to to push forward the foreign policy of Indonesia to be increasingly high profile as they seek tighter relationship with pa- the Pacific and Indian Ocean major powers with a heavy focus on the domestic economy dimension rather than the ASEAN or regional dimension. This is in opposition with the focus of multilateralism and norms promotion that was stressed during the Yudo Yono administration. So how would ASEAN be positioned under Jokowi government's foreign policy? That is actually quite a huge deal because the ASEAN economic community will be uh, realising uh, in this year and beyond. So creating a single market by focusing on the ASEAN market is definitely something that a lot of the Southeast Asian countries are looking forward. In fact, even Laos, uh, which is the next year's ASEAN Summit chair, has been uh, trying to refocus itself uh, politically to ensure that it is um, AEC prepared. But for Indonesia... Uh, will AAC be a disadvantage for Indonesia by merely being a market for good goods produced by neighboring country, or would it actually gain more um, economic advantage or benefits from the AEC? 
So the emerging trends are worrying as ASEAN is entering a deeper phase of integration and the proactive role of Indonesia is being awaited, but it's not being seen. In fact, Indonesia has been very much more nationali- nationalistic in its approach, confirming Indonesia's apparent move away from ASEAN. Uh, what it seems, uh, it seems to be that uh, with Jokowi, he wants to focus more on other areas of development, which has probably might not have anything to do with um, ASEAN itself. What uh, perhaps ASEAN need to reframe, to reframing itself in a way that it is more strat- strategically positioned towards the Indonesia advantage considering that Indonesia is the largest and most populous nation in Southeast Asia. Anyway, uh, considering that Joko Widodo is also um, uh, someone that is a crucial player in ensuring that the AEC will be materialized, uh, consensus within the ASEAN, uh, especially from Indonesia, is very, very important. Uh, Indonesia has to negotiate its position to gain the support of other members in making ASEAN as the main driver of the Pacific and Indian Ocean regional architecture. The, when it comes to bargaining, that means it, it, it is quite in terms of providing public goods, uh, such as being at the forefront to strengthen ASEAN unity, working together with member states to push for deeper integration of institutions. Right now, uh, I mean, I just give example of even educational institution is very much lacking. Um, that's just only education, but in order for um, ASEAN to be taken seriously, it has to have a deeper institutional roots in human rights and democracy especially. And the point to stress that uh, that ASEAN is definitely having a lot of uh, external security threats, especially with the Southeast China Sea. And if the ASEAN centrality is broken, that means um, Indonesia or the rest of Southeast Asia would would not be able to achieve the kind of single economic and and unity that that its forefather those who formed ASEAN in the early years would envision it to be. So anyway, um, that means in other words, more consistency is needed in order for ASEAN to move forward in its focus. Talking about focus, uh, more consisten- consistency is also needed in terms of palm oil policy in Borneo. And when I talk about Borneo, I'm talking about Sabah and Sarawak. So India emerged as Malaysia's biggest palm oil buyer at 2.87 million tons in the first 11 months last year, which was 35% more than the 2.12 million tons posted in 2013 the same period as well. But anyway, the situation has changed. Uh, last month, Indian India raised the import duty of root palm oil to 7.5% from 2.5%. It, that's a huge jump, in fact. It also increased the duty on refined palm oil to 15% from 10%. And uh, according to the Palm Oil Refiners Association of Malaysia, Chief Executive Officer Muhammad Jafar Ahmad said that India's decision was not surprising. It was meant to protect the interests of its oil seed farmer and edible oil refiners. So looking at this, India is in fact being much more uh, protectionist in terms of its domestic market. But it's also a signal to Malaysia that they are not interested to buy that much CPO or root palm oil. It warrants that Malaysia should stop declaring duty-free CPO export and let market forces detect its cost. I send some libertarians. Um, a market-driven agenda there. But anyway, uh, it looks like uh, many people think refiners and planters are at loggerheads. But in fact, the assumption is wrong because refiners are purely concern about the price gap and not how low the CPO prices will go. In fact, it is a misconception that in times of 
falling CPO price. Refiners are happy at the expense of planters. Um, as refiners, we are as refiners, uh, they are margin players. It doesn't matter if CPO prices are high or low. Um, from upstream to downstream of the palm oil value chain wins when CPO prices are high. There is a role that the in is in supporting that the CPO as they buy and possess every drop of the CPO in the country. Um, so in a way that Malaysia needs to make sure that it can reform its palm oil policy to ensure that it has a higher CPO. Uh, since, uh, on the other note, uh, China's palm oil demand has been artificially pushed as financial products rather than commodity products. Uh, since banks in China give peculiar treatment to palm oil, viewing it as an institutional instrument, palm oil cooking and margarine demand will continue to be argumented by fiscal policy changes there. Nevertheless, uh, the current shortfall in China's palm oil purchase is also excavated by subdued consumer spending. China's is Malaysia's best cooking oil market. Can't doubt that. <laughs> in view of the cautious consumer spending, we need to be more focused on market segmentation to raise the popularity and branding of Malaysia's oil. So, Malaysian government... It's important that um, to give the subject of palm oil, uh, especially in terms of its branding, a significant high, in terms of its policy also a significant high. Also not to forget its environmental impact. So the broad objective is to suggest that it is an environmental goods and services under the ASEAN Trade in Good Agreement. Um, and eventually adopt the regional co the regional comprehensive economic partnership branding or the RCEP, which would focus on our countries within Southeast Asia and its other six member partners. And this will be also uh, good for the ASEAN economic community, especially it's going to turn into a single market. So uh, having a more focused palm oil policy rather than a flip-flop one, uh, especially in, in terms of the area of whether the government should exempt CPO export duty or not is something that Malaysian government need to tackle and perhaps more research in doing what kind of direction that we want to have in terms of ensuring Malaysian palm oil industry is protected and more exports will be able to go out from this country. To end our news today, I want to give a little brief on the Philippines. Apparently, it's the first ASEAN country to join the EU's general system of preferen preferences plus or GSP plus. So European Parliamentary, uh, sorry, the, the European Parliament officially granted the Philippines request for inclusion of the EU general system uh, or of GSP. The Philippines will soon be able to export tariff-free over 6,200 products or 66% of all product tariff lines to the EU, including processed fruit, coconut oil, footwear, fish and textile. This is definitely a good move and and uh, in, if the Philippines definitely could enlarge its export uh, towards EU and strengthen its bilateral relationship with the region up north from uh, Southeast Asia. So uh, GSP, which the Philippines applied to join uh, since last year, February, is the next round of the EU's generalized scheme of preferences, a trade preference sch a scheme for developing countries. 
and which covers a total of 6,274 tariff lines under the GSP. The Philippines will be able to uh, export um, more than 600 goods and services and it will definitely increase uh, in terms of the estimation of new jobs um, in, in the area of manufacturing and agriculture, most of which will be in rural areas outside of major cities. So, in fact, even the Philippines are looking more than just ASEAN. So perhaps more focus on the ASEAN economic community. That's all for our news today. We will continue with our Monday Morning Matters, where we will discuss how the oil uh, prices, which are crashing as low as much as low as possible in the coming months, um, would affect the ASEAN economic community.